Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack on uh, partnerships um, and maybe try and explain, bring it back down maybe to ground level. Uh, John has covered the, the, the registration side of it. Um, so I'm going to cover a little bit maybe in relation to every, everybody in this room and their role within the whole setup. And, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe look at two case studies at the end. So um, just broadening it out a small bit to look at collaborative arrangements in general, um, partnerships are one form. Um, so they normally take the, 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 I suppose, take the role of within the family or outside the family or between two farmers. But we also have the other arrangements that we have templates available for and we might see those later on in, in the afternoon. Um, you know, the, the contract area, heifer rearing, um, share farming. All of these type of arrangements require collaboration between farmers in some shape or form. But there's a lot of uh, common, common, I suppose, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Con you know, there's consistent um, things that you need to, to make all of those operations work. So um, one of the things I was looking at, and I suppose look at, uh, when I was putting this together, I was looking at maybe the, the age group of farmers. And uh, you, know, you could ask us, how do farmers decide which option they would choose? And one of the potential things is, you know, what, what age are they at and do they intend to continue farming longer term or short term? Do they have, um, do they have a successor on the farm? And what implications would that have for the type of arrangement they might choose? So, you know, if, if they don't intend to farm in the next number of years, you know, they might consider maybe, maybe it's a farm sale, maybe they consider, consider the long term land leasing or transfer to a, a successor or a relative. Um, you know, if they don't intend to, they, they might be options, we'll say. Um, if they have, uh, you know, if you ask somebody, have they a successor or is that successor ready? Those type of questions. Um, if the successor isn't ready, what does what does the farmer do in the meantime? A lot will depend on their, you know, maybe their 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 health, their their activeness on the farm, their ability to work the farm and continue the farming operations. So they might consider maybe partnership or share farming with with a young trained farmer who's not a family member. Uh, they might look at the long term land leasing and all all they're trying to do. I'm not saying these are the key questions that you could think of. Uh, everybody in this room could think of other questions, but it's really just asking the type of questions of the farmer to consider. Uh, what options they might choose. The presence of a successor is a big impact on the farm, not, not just in terms of uh, what option you might choose here, but maybe the operation of the farm as well. Um, so if there is a successor identified, um, and if that successor is ready, then maybe forming a partnership with that successor and, and coming, uh, you know, talking about the forming succession plan that Tomás Russell will talk to you about before lunch, um, and then maybe leading to the eventual transfer to that person. I mean, that, that's the nice easy route, if you like. Um, but if, if the successor isn't ready, what do you do in the meantime? Um, so are there options there? Uh, do you continue farming in the status quo, um, continue operating the farm and progressing the farm on with a view to handing over in the future? Um, or if, if, if the person is at an age where they're not able to continue the farming operations, do they look at something that's maybe less intensive? And that's maybe where uh, the other options might come in. Um, in terms of choosing something like contract rearing or reducing the, the intensity of the enterprise for a period of time until the successor is ready to kick it on again. So it's, it's really just a series of questions to, to stimulate people to think about maybe what collaborative options might suit them. Um, okay, so what are, what's success based on in these arrangements? Um, and again, you can apply this right across the arrangements. Um, the key thing with collaboration is that the working relationship the, between the two individuals, whether that's within the family or outside of the family, is absolutely vital. So what's that based on? It's based on good values, like respect for each other. You know, trust is, is absolutely huge. Um, communication is, is, I suppose, the, the vehicle about, you know, where mutual respect is, is, is communicated, the trust between the partners, it, it, the communication is absolutely central to it. And then just a willingness to compromise. I think, um, you know, the, there's, when you go into a collaborative arrangement, you're moving from a sort of an arrangement where you're farming in your own right um, for a period of time and you're, you're making your decisions for maybe in your own right and then suddenly you're getting into an arrangement where you have to consider um, another person and that's really important um, to, the, to the arrangement. We'll talk about the well-written agreement. An agreement is absolutely vital and, and again the audience today has a vital role in that uh, whatever the discipline is. Um, 
I would see if you look at a lot of, in, especially in the non-family situations, um, previous work and relationships, the ability to build up a relationship to see, and that's all related down to compatibility. You know, how, how do you figure out whether people are compatible to work together or not? And, and that's where that sort of, if you look at a lot of the very successful partnerships there, um, that, that had, most of them have that element to them. And again, I suppose another point to make, I suppose, is the ability to generate multiple incomes um, is, is very important. Um, you know, and that's within the family. So this, this collaborative arrangement essentially has to provide at least two incomes, two, two, you know, to the income to two households, maybe, for each partner, whether that's within the family or, or outside of the family. So in the family scenarios, you do see a kind of a flux period there where a son or daughter comes home to farm with the parents, and can the farm sustain that, or does that have to be sustained with outside work? Um, so there, there are challenges that, that families have to face. And I think in terms of uh, you know, the, the arrangement in general, farmers certainly need to take a broad view. So you know, rather than just uh, looking at something like purely the resources available, um, to, to the, the other partner, you know, you have to look at skill sets. If you look at other countries where collaborative arrangements are very popular, skill, skill sets are hugely valued. You know, so if I'm a very good stockman, I mightn't be so good on the financial side, can the partner that I get involved with bring that skill set to the arrangement and improve the overall operation of the arrangement? So that's really important. What are the goals and the needs of that other partner, be it your son or daughter, or be it another farmer? What do they need from this arrangement? What sort of values do they have? You know, are they, uh, I suppose, a neat and tidy freak and you're a messy person? Would that create issues in the arrangement? Um, these are all vital to the success of, of the arrangement and working on it. What are the benefits, be they lifestyle benefits, you know, um, scheme benefits, I suppose, financial benefits? There's a lot that you could list there. So, you know, thinking about the arrangement with, in, from the other person's point of view as well as your own. The compatibility I've talked about already. And what are the risks? What are the risks for the other person in going in? The, the risk that the arrangement might break down, there could be a big fallout. The risk that, you know, if I, if I was heavily borrowed, would that have put a big strain on the arrangement? So they're, they're, you know, you need to really look at, when you're considering a partner, looking at it in a much broad based, um, much more broad based um, perspective. Okay. So, <coughs> just in terms of partnerships, um, John mentioned the register. I just want to talk a little bit about the structure of it um, and what are the steps maybe in forming it and who's involved and what role it plays. And we'll talk about benefits as well. So just to remind ourselves what a partnership is, it's ultimately a profit sharing arrangement where two or more farmers come together to share the profits. Um, so that's essentially what it is. And as John says, you can't be in two partnerships, but you can add, you can add new partners to it. And it must be at least five years. Um, we have our website there, which you'll have, that's on the memory stick that you got in your pack, um, so all the arrangements are there for you to view them. Um, so in terms of the role, it's a transition arrangement, and if within the family, it has proven to be a very good transition arrangement to bring the son or daughter on board in a meaningful way. That, that, what does that mean? When we put our sons and daughters through agricultural college, or, or UCD, or whatever the case may be, or they go and they get experience abroad or at home, you know, when they return home to farm with the parents, it's very important that they're, they're listened to, that their views are considered, and that when decisions are being taken on the farm, that they're part of that process. So in an interacting with yourselves, the professionals that work with them, you know, they, they, they need to be involved in all of that. And that, that's really important for their development and their, you know, their, their development as a farmer, if you like. Um, and it's generally between the parent or son or daughter. So that's where the transition arrangement occurs. Between non-family partners then, or non-family partnerships, you're talking about maybe between two or more farmers. So uh, we have a lot of very successful partnerships operating out there in various different uh, enterprises. So the, the, between an existing farmer and a young person, that's another one that we have, I suppose, when we look at the age group of farmers now. We have a lot of farmers who've identified they have no successor. So what's wrong with them maybe going into partnership with somebody else's son or daughter who's, who's willing to work the farm and work with them on the farm? Okay. The structure. The structure of the agreement is very important um, and uh, I suppose I worked as an advisor and I didn't have a lot of knowledge in this until I learned a lot from Ben and, and Dermot and came into this role. But I've been, I suppose I've been reinforced in terms of the, the template and how important the template is. Um, you know, uh, farmers oftentimes would like a one-page agreement um, and it's a quick, a quick thing to sign the bottom of it. But, you know, what does that cover? And that will be the context maybe of our discussion in the afternoon. But 
There's two key structures within the partnership uh, agreement that's there, and one is a license. And that's important from the point of view that it's a legal permission to use the assets such as land, buildings, entitlements. Um, milk quotas in the past would have been included there, but shares in a dairy co-op, contracts for grain and seed. If you're going into partnership with your son or daughter or with another farmer, you want to be sure that you can take those assets back out when, when the thing ends. Um, so that's why that license is important. Um, within the family it's important because it gives security to parents that they don't have to, there's no transfer. I often get phone calls from people to say, you know, if, will I have to transfer so many acres or so many hectares to the son or daughter to go into partnership with them. You know, so there's a lot of um, misconceptions out there too. But that license is very important. The other, the other thing that's very important is the creation of a capital account for the partners. So the accountants in the room will be very, very familiar with this. That's to value the livestock and the machinery and the working capital. And that needs to be included. As John said, you know, the agreement needs to be completed and those two elements need to be completed within the document. Um, but that gives you a starting point um, for the, it gives you a starting point for the formation of the, so each partner knows what amount of capital they've contributed at the start of the agreement. Okay, um, so forming the partnership. If a farmer wants to form a partnership, who does he consult with? Who's involved in that process? So all of those people on the slide there can be involved in that. So the accountant needs to be involved from a revenue perspective, um, the solicitor from a legal perspective, the Chagas advisor maybe from a technical perspective, a bit of knowledge on all of the areas, the consultant likewise in the same category, and then the <coughs> Department of Agriculture. The, the interaction with um, you know, your district veterinary office, the partnership office, um, you know, the, the, the single farm payment entitlement sections, uh, BPS now, all of that. All, they all have interactions in the whole process of forming a partnership. And I suppose it's important, the reason that I stress that is I get a lot of calls um, from farmers where I'd refer them on, you need to talk to your accountant, you need to talk to their solicitor, and it's maybe one of the reasons why we're having this conference today is that the knowledge level is quite low in a lot of, in a lot of cases. So, you know, to be aware that there is expertise out there and maybe to share that. Okay, so generally who completes the agreement? Uh, it's generally the accountant, the solicitor, the consultant, or a combination. So, you know, if it's a consultant, he may be referring the farmer on to the, the accountant or the solicitor and maybe completing the, the registration process subsequently. Okay, um, what does the farmer focus on? So when the, when the um, partnership agreement is, is formed, what should the farmer focus on? And the way I view this is, if that farmer is going to get out of bed tomorrow morning and he's in a partnership tomorrow morning and he wasn't in it today, what is the difference to him? And the only way that they can really focus on that is to focus on the on-farm agreement. So Ben came up with the on-farm agreement for the milk production partnerships, but again, it applies right across all the collaborative arrangements. The, the interaction of the farmer is going to be what has changed in, in his working day and in his life. And that is, you know, what sort of structure? If you talk to people in partnerships, uh, one of the big things they talk about is lifestyle. And they've convinced me that they have a better lifestyle in farming than, than their non-partnership counterparts, simply because they have a good work structure where they, they alternate work. They work together very well in the busy times and then they alternate time off um, in the less busy times. That gives them lifestyle and it's the structure that does that. So you do that by, by identifying skill sets, interests, um, and by identifying areas of responsibility for each partner. The areas that I would take maybe responsibility as one partner, and my other partner might take responsibility for another area. Um, so examples of that would be if I, if I register the calves and he looks after the financial records. It's sharing out that to the benefit of all of us. Leading on that then to the time off, time off and holidays, how is that going to be structured? And they need to be structured fairly. And then the whole area of salaries and drawings, how is that going to be set up? Because everybody has to be happy with what the other partners are taking out of the arrangement. Um, so it needs to be established. And again, the accountant would have a role there because essentially you can't take money out that isn't there. So the salaries and the drawings have to be balanced with what the actual farm profit is. Um, and again, it goes back, as I said, to what I said earlier about the ability to generate multiple incomes when you go into this. It all it ties in together. Okay, so the role of the accountant in setting this up, forming the partnership, what do they need to do? They need first of all to register the partnership with revenue on the TR1 form if it's not already done. Um, that needs to be done. Maybe the cessation commencement rules need to be applied. Um, you know, create capital accounts for each partner. Advising the start date of the partnership, in other words, that it would start maybe from the, the end of the previous tax year. 
um, advise on drawings and salaries, and liaise maybe with the solicitor or the consultant or whoever is actually completing the, the, the um, documentation for the farmer. So they're, they're the areas that I would see the accountant being involved in. Then in terms of what does he have to do after that, he's to calculate the profit for the partnership. He's got to apply the profit sharing ratio that's written into the partnership agreement. Um, and then make separate tax returns for each partner. He doesn't necessarily have to make the tax returns for all partners, but he's got, he's got to make separate tax returns for each. And complete a firm's one form that shows how the profit was split and what percentage it was split on. So they're the type of roles for the accountant, very important roles. In terms of solicitor, review the template agreement. So there's a template agreement there. It's not a one, shoe, one size fits all shoe. Um, there may need to be amendments to that or inclusions in it or you know, uh, depending on the family circumstances or, and so on. So it's about tailoring the agreement to suit the circumstances of the client. Um, so adding in clauses, deleting clauses, modifying the document maybe to include more. So the template agreement is there, only covers two partners. But if you have um, a father, mother and son, then you need to make room in the document for a third partner. Um, explain the legal structure to the client. What, what's actually in the document? I often find that you run through the document fairly quickly. There's a lot of clauses in it. Um, but, you know, are they, are they read when you're filling it out at the start? Um, will they only be read when you're trying to dissolve it maybe later on? And they're all very important. And again, to liaise with the accountant and the consultant as well. Okay. Um, so, what are the benefits? Um, I always start with the, the non-financial benefits because they're, these, these to me are the key ones. That transition arrangement before inheritance is absolutely vital, um, you know, to bring that son or daughter on board, as I said. I've, parents, feedback from parents is that it provides great reassurance because a lot of parents, when they have a son or daughter that's ready to form a partnership, they're not in a position to transfer land and they don't want to get into that. And they can, by forming a partnership, they don't have to do that. So that's very important. The shared management and decision making is really important. And also the ability, that it's nurturing that relationship between the parents and the son and daughter that they, they can work together um, and use that experience of the parents and a guiding, use, use that, uh, the guiding hand of the parents. And then oftentimes it can be finding a balance between uh, a very enthusiastic young person and a more measured older person who's been through, through farming uh, over a number of years and a written agreement with the defined roles. Okay, the non-family labour efficiency cuts out duplication of work. You have two labour units in a lot of farms where you have only one. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's what leads on then to the better lifestyle. That's hugely important. Sometimes uh, it may lead to reduced capital investment because you make use of the facilities that are already there. Okay, just in terms of financial benefits, taxation. If a young person goes into partnership with their parents, uh, they can maybe access stock relief for the first four years if they have their education done and they're under 35. Um, the enhanced stock relief is there now for registered partnerships, 50%. So that's, if, if stock numbers are increasing, stock relief can be a big financial benefit. Um, also, forming a partnership, uh, you know, it, you're sharing out the profits. So for somebody who is paying tax at the high rate, uh, the sharing of profits um, will actually maybe reduce the overall tax paid. So it can be a, a useful vehicle there. And I suppose the, the, the tax credit that was announced in the budget, pen, pending state aid rule clarification, we'll say, but uh, that, that's hugely positive as well. Um, in terms of the cap, I'm not going to spend long on this because Bernie outlined it, but I mean, you know, going into partnership essentially means that, uh, you know, the, the young person can access those, um, those benefits. So the, the, the young farmer scheme in the National Reserve, uh, the TAMs, the doubling of the investment ceiling, um, you know, if you have two farmers coming together, the GLOSS and the ANC, that they, they can continue to get two payments in those schemes. And then, as John mentioned, the collaborative uh, establishment grant scheme, which is uh, there as well. Okay, very quickly, I'm just going to bring this down to ground level. Um, these are two farmers I know pretty well. So after you go through all the legal and the accounting side of it, what does it mean? Um, this is an example uh, of, uh, of two farmers in West Cork, two neighbours. Um, Jared Creedon on the right hand side is a young farmer in his early 30s, married with two children. Patrick on the left uh, is married with one daughter who lives in Australia. She's not going to be a successor. Um, I suppose what you'd explain here is Jared, Jared had gone as far as he could go. He bought 60 cows, he got back into farming, borrowed money, got back into farming, but couldn't go beyond 60 cows because of the restriction of his land base. So 
he drove into the yard and I spent a bit of time discussing how he might do this. He drove into the yard to Patrick one day and he talked about maybe a partial lease or a partnership and he just floated the idea with him. Um, and Patrick gave him a funny look and then he, he got into his car and he drove out. He wasn't sure how it went down. But a week later, uh, Patrick drove back into the yard to him and he said, look, I was thinking about what you said. Um, you're, you want to drive on your farming career. I want to step back in mine. So maybe the one thing he was adamant about, and this goes back to my decision map earlier and what, what um, the farmer would like to do. But Patrick was adamant he wanted to continue actively farming. So he had ruled out land leasing as an option. Um, and you know, they have put 68 hectares together um, and they plan to expand to 240 cows. And what I would say is that Patrick's farm had regressed back. The grassland was poor. You know, th there was a lot of overgrowth and drainage needed and so on. But he's actually got a new lease of life. I visited them earlier on this summer and, you know, he's, he's, it's like a weight has been lifted off him. He hasn't got the responsibility of the whole operation. It's shared between the two. But he's extremely happy doing the jobs he's doing in that partnership. Um, and as I say, he's got a renewed enthusiasm from farming. So it's one that I, I know the lads very well and I was very involved during the time putting it together. And, uh, you know, it's just an example of what partnership can actually do at ground level. OK, so I'm going to leave it at that, Billy. I have another one, but I haven't time for it. <laughs>